We're in chapter 2. I think I almost closed this up here about a week ago, but we're going to look at it one more time. We're going to come right through it, and maybe we'll close the door on it. What do you think? We'll come close the door in chapter 2. We're not going to close the door in Philippians. Philippians, the first chapter, we found out that we're saints in Christ Jesus. Do you see that over there? To all the saints in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, then you're a saint. A saint means that you have been called out by God. You have been separated to God. You belong to God. You belong to God. You belong to God. You belong to God. Now, it's good to belong. Everybody likes to belong. But it's really good when you belong to God. Amen. That's who you want to belong to. If you're a saint in Christ Jesus, you belong to God. And the Bible says grace and peace be unto you. From God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us in verse 6 that God began a good work in you. That's something the church can't do. That's something the preacher can't do. That's something that you can't do. Nobody can begin a good work in you but God. And because He called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, He has begun a good work in you. Jesus talked to Nicodemus about that good work as being a new birth. A new birth took place. You had no mind, no heart, no affections for God whatsoever. The Bible says the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. The Bible says the carnal mind is at enmity towards God. It's not subject to the law of God. It's not subject to the righteousness of God. It's not subject, and neither can it be, because of its nature. But when God began a good work in you, He gave you a new birth. God's Holy Spirit opened up here, gave you a new heart, took out the old heart, gave you a new heart, gave you eyes to see with, ears to hear with, and now when you listen to the Bible taught, you understand it like you've never understood it before. When you hear about Jesus, you hear about Jesus not as somebody on a holy card, not somebody that's nailed to a crucifix, but you hear about the eternal God of glory. God's only begotten Son, coming in the flesh, living a life representing you, a sinless life, going to the cross and answering the law that you and I broke and transgressed. And there he turned away the wrath of God, that the peace of God might come into our life, that we might be forgiven and reconciled unto Almighty God. These things mean everything to you once you're born again. When that takes place, repentance comes in your heart. The thing you want to do most of all is you want to turn away from your sins. You want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that here in chapter 1. He takes us through many different things in chapter 1. He takes us down here to verse 27. Uh, and he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, don't let anything about your conduct be contradictory of the gospel. The gospel, the person Jesus, the work of Jesus. Don't let anything about your life be contradictory. Let everything about your life match the gospel. Now, when you get ready to go somewhere, you look at your clothes, and you got a pair of uh, white pants on, you put a white shirt. That doesn't match. You need a dark colored shirt, right? You go in the mirror, you put your outfit on, you put these earrings, these earrings don't match. You're looking for something that matches, right? You want everything about your life to match the gospel. Slang doesn't match the gospel. Cursing doesn't match the gospel. Foul language doesn't match the gospel. Fornication doesn't match the gospel. Arguing doesn't match the gospel. Are you with me? All those behavior habits, sinful habits that, that were a part of us before we came to Christ are to be put off, the Bible says. Put away. Those things are not to be a part of our life. These things are not even to be even named among us as Christians, the scriptures teach us. Isn't that good? And so he comes into chapter 2 and he, and he talks about having being, uh, being united in our faith. He talks about the unity of the spirit. And he says, let each one of you look out not only for your own interest, but the interests of others. There it is right there. That is the answer to every relationship that could be having a struggle. Look not after your own interests, but the interests of others. 
That is one of the most difficult thing to do because that is what sin doesn't want you to do. Sin, what is sin, Harmony? I taught you all week, say it. Rebellion, rebellion against God. And if you got, re sin is rebellion against God, what does that mean? It means you got a wrong attitude towards God. How's that wrong attitude look towards God? It means that he comes second and you come first. But the first commandment is, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You should have no other gods before you. He is always to be first. And when he begins this good work in you, he is now first. And because he's first in your life, and your relationship with others, you want to honor him. So you don't look after your own interest alone, but you look after the interest of others. In other words, I'm not just concerned about me, but I'm concerned about you. I'm not just concerned how I'm going to make it. I'm concerned how you're going to make it. I'm not so concerned what I want. I'm also concerned what you want. I'm not just concerned what I need. I'm also concerned what you need. Amen? The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it means. And so we've seen in verses 5 down through verse 11 that this, this mind of putting others first above ourselves was manifested in the life of Jesus. It said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How he didn't think it to be something that he was being robbed from, robbed from him, not to be considered to be equal with God when he humbled himself and made himself as a servant. He did that because he was not looking after his own interests, but he's looking after the interests of those he came to lay down his life for. Amen. And because he did what he did, you and I have salvation. And because he did what he did, he was, he was highly rewarded. He was exalted to the right hand of God. He was given a name above every name. That every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He comes into verse 12, and the heading of my Bible says, Light bearers. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but also much more in my absence. He's in prison now. He says, When I was with you, you were always obeying the teaching I gave you. Now, when I'm not with you any longer, keep obeying the teaching. Keep doing something with the teaching. Don't be a hearer of the word of God only, but be a doer of the word. Do something with what I have taught you and what you're continually to be taught. You'll never know the value of the teaching of the word of God until you put it in action, until you put it into practice. That's when, you, that's when what you learn pays to you its richest dividends is when you act upon it, when you do something with it, when you put it to practice. And he flushes that out when he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You have salvation. God has already begun a good work in you. You don't have to try to do anything to get that good work. You already have that good work. It's already begun on the inside of you. You already have salvation. You've been justified. God, not only were you justified, the moment you were justified, you were sanctified, meaning God began to get rid of the trash in your life. Let me just say something to you. This came to me by the Lord the other day, and I think someone here in this room needs to hear this. Have you ever heard a testimony about someone getting saved and, and they were a drug addict and also their drugs are gone? Or they were drinking and all of a sudden they don't drink anymore and they wonder why. And another person, you know, might have been just a, a, a fornicator and they, they just were so uh, lustful all the time, but all of a sudden that was broken over their life. And you hear these instant things that just happened. And other people hear that testimony and they wonder, well, why hasn't that happened to me? Why do I still struggle with certain things? God in his sovereignty and in his mercy may do that to some. Rick, I remember one time told us, he says, you know what? I was driving home with Jill one night and I turned to Jill and said, you know, we haven't had a drink. It's been weeks or months. And it's not even anything they tried to put their mind to do. It just happened. That was, they were experiencing a special work of God's grace. <coughs> People remember Lauren Larson down there with Jimmy Swagger. He came up and ministered. He was a drug addict. And when he got saved, absolutely no, no none whatsoever uh, addiction to drugs whatsoever. But he still smoked. He still had struggles with that. He still had struggles with other things in your life. So though you hear testimonies about things happening instantly and gloriously to some individual, 
It doesn't mean that happens to everybody. It does happen to some. There's some people that when they get saved, they're healed automatically, just instantly healed over something they had. Just instantly. That doesn't happen to everybody. You have to realize that. And because it doesn't happen to everybody, there's going to be, you and I are going to have to work out our salvation. We're going to have to work out the fact that God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, gave us a new birth. We're in union with Jesus. And by Jesus, we bear forth the fruits of righteousness. We're going to work it out. That means we're going to obey the admonitions, the exhortations, the, the uh, different appeals that the New Testament gives us to go this way, walk this way, go this direction because of Christ, because of who he is, because of who you are in Christ. Let's live this way. Okay? And so he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says fear and trembling because it's God who's at work within you. Realize that God who began this good work in you didn't give up on the good work that he began. In fact, back in verse 6 it says, he that began this he, uh, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun this good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's not completed, it's just begun. It will be completed when Jesus returns, when we receive our glorification. It will be completed, but, but it's only begun. So in other words, now he tells us over here in verses 12 and 13 that there's an ongoing work. You see that over there in the book of Ephesians. He gives us all these great doctrines about God calling us, God saving us, God delivering us by the blood of Jesus. And then he says, therefore, put off the old man and put on the new man. Put away lying, put away stealing, put away anger, put away malice, put away these things. Put on love, put on bowels of mercy. Be kind and tender hearted one to another. He, what's he doing? He's telling you to work out your salvation. He's teaching you to walk out what you got. Walk out what you got. You got a lot. You got Christ on the inside of you. You got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Amen. You're an heir of God, a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. You got a lot. You, all that you got on the inside of you, now you need to walk it out. Amen. Live it out. Let it be seen for what you have. Praise God forevermore. But much more work, uh, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So how do you work it out? Well, when he was there present with you, you were obeying what he said. You were listening to his appeals. You were saying, yes, amen, to everything that he was saying. Let's go this way. Let's go this way. Because of this, let's walk this way. He was giving you Christian doctrine. And out of Christian doctrine comes Christian conduct. Whatever person believes is what they're going to live, saved or unsaved. However you think and believe is how you're going to live. Christians are now finding a new way to think, a new way to believe. Jesus is the source of everything. They have the Holy Spirit within them. They're receiving the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are changing the way they think in their mind. And now it's affecting the way they live. The scheme of sanctification in the New Testament is God teaches you the doctrines of Christ, the doctrines of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the doctrines of the Christian faith. And in the light of those doctrines, in the light of your position in Christ, now he calls you to live it out. Live this way. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for as God who's at work within you. Recognize that God that began that good work is still there. Now, you may not always be conscious of it, you know, it's just like, where is the Lord at? He's there. Don't ever doubt it. He said, I never leave you nor forsake you, that you can boldly say the Lord is my helper. In other words, when I'm working these things out, I'm working these things out with his help. I'm working these things out with his strength. And I'm working out these things with his grace, with his Holy Spirit. I'm not alone. I'm not left to myself. I'm not left to my hands and my feet. I'm not left to my, my will, trying to will to do it. No, I have God at work within me. Both the will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, he's given me the will to do it. He's given me the, the do or the power to do it. He's at work within me. What if I don't feel him at work? You're never going to actually feel God. You believe God. You believe what the scripture says about him. And when you believe what the scripture says about him, and you act on the scriptures, what the scriptures say about him, sometimes you kind of get a little bit of a feeling that he's there. Amen. 
Oh, there's sometimes, you know, when I was first raised up as a Christian, everything was experience, 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 feeling, experience, feeling, and experience. And you had to experience and feel God all the time. Otherwise, you didn't know if you were a Christian or not. Always. And that's a trap of the devil because the devil will get you hooked on a feeling. You ever hear that song? Can you sing that song, Billy? Hooked on a feeling. I bet Rick can sing that song. Rick says, I'm not singing today, Pastor. There's an old song called Hooked on a Feeling. The devil tried to get you hooked on a feeling. He gets you hooked on a feeling, you're going to be in trouble. Your mind will start saying, oh, you're this way and that way. And you'll be wavering all over the place. The Lord gives you facts. The Bible are the facts. The New Testament is the facts. He gives you the facts about Christ. He gives you the facts of his death, his resurrection, the facts of your union with Christ, the facts of the, the Christian doctrine. Facts. You eat the facts. You believe the facts. You trust in the facts. You live in the light of the facts. Then the feelings come. Don't put feelings in front of the facts. Put the facts, walk in the light of the facts, feelings will come. I don't know anybody who doesn't like to have good feelings, especially if you've experienced the feelings of God's presence and the feelings of, of his communion and his fellowship. We all love it. But I'd be a liar to tell you that I have that each and every day, all day. I don't have that. And any Christian tells you they have that, they're superficial. They really don't have that. But I have a whole lot more of it when I'm putting the facts first, faith in those facts, and the feelings follow. I like Feelings come in, follow me. I'm, I'm chasing after the facts of God's word. Amen. Blessed be the name of Jesus. So he goes on to say, do all things without complaining, without disputing. That simply means that when God's at work within you and he's uh, working in you to will and to do what he wants, he's, he's changing things, oftentimes he runs into a problem where you don't want to work together with him, work it out together with him. So he'll bring some chastisement. He'll bring some discipline that you might be a partaker of his holiness so that you will walk out these things. And when those things happen, a lot of times they happen in the context of difficult circumstances. And our temptation is, is to complain about it or murmur about it and get in dispute. Well, doesn't God love me? Doesn't he care about me? Why is this happening to me? I don't understand this, you know. And he wants me to live this way. Well, why should I live the way he wants me to live if he's not taking care of this? And so we get into this. He says, don't do that. God's at work within you. He's, want, he's wanting to make you into the person that he has intended for you to be. You are his workmanship, created in Christ, unto good works. And good, good works is godly living. Remember how we looked at that? Good works is abstaining that from fleshly lust, abstaining from that which is evil, that which is fleshly. Amen. Good works is bearing forth the fruits of righteousness. Good works is living a life that matches the gospel. And sometimes you can get yourself, you get yourself, you know, uh, in mismatched relationships that pull and drag you the wrong direction. I remember when I was a kid, we lived over here in Grove Terrace, never got in trouble. We moved over here in Bourne Street, near, over there by Pennsylvania. I was in trouble all the time because of who, who I hang out with. I think Randy uh, or Rick or one of you guys told me one time when you talk to the guys down at the jail, you say, hey, when you get out of here, don't go by your old friends. Isn't that right, Randy? Don't go by your old friends. What are they going to do? They're going to drag you down. You know, I can't mention names, but we have somebody we love here that had to go get some help to get off some drugs. And the one thing they told us is that they're not coming back because they, they can't afford to get near their, their old friends. They'll get pulled right back down into it. Bible says, watch out. Wrong communications corrupt good manners. Wrong communications is talking about wrong relationships can corrupt. Got to be careful of all that. Be careful of that. Not everybody is as they appear. Not everybody is as they appear. Marty used to say, man, look at that Saddam Hussein. He just looks like such a nice fella. I says, honey, he might look like a nice fella, but he's nasty. He's really nasty. When I was a little boy, they said, oh, that little Stevie angel. I was really Stevie the devil. They didn't know it. My mom hates it when I say those things. She told me the other day, all I want to think about you, son, is good things. Well, go ahead, mom. That's okay. But I've been nasty. Nasty. 
Do all things without complaint and disputing. In other words, when God's at work within you, sometimes He's chastening you, He's disciplining you. When He does that, He's not hurting you, He's loving you. He has something He's intending for you that's much better, and that is that you be a partaker of His holiness, that you are found living the kind of life that He wants you to live. Verse 15 says, He does this, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation whom you shine as lights in this world. In other words, God wants you to be blameless on the outside where people look at your conduct, they look at your behavior, and they say, wow, that is a person of moral integrity. Why are they the way they are? And then on the inside, you're harmless. You're harmless. In other words, you're pure, you're unadulterated, you're not carrying wrong desires, wrong thoughts. Uh, in other words, what they see on the outside is what you are on the inside. And he says, you're without rebuke. So inside and outside, you're without rebuke. And in contrast to the world that is crooked and perverse, it's like, wow, it's like the stars in heaven shining against the, the black night of the universe. And you're such a difference. God wants you and I to have a major difference. Now, when I first got saved, your, your brother Rick and I were good friends. And I just didn't want Rick to think that I was a weirdo because I'm a Christian. I thought, well, I can still do what I, uh, yeah, I can still go and be with you. Where are you going tonight? Well, I'm going to the bar. I said, well, I'll go to the bar. So I went to the bar. And I thought, well, I'm not going to drink. Well, next thing you know, I got a beer in my hand. I'm trying to sip it, you know, trying to make it last a long time. I'm, I, I want to share the gospel. No one's, I'm not sharing the gospel. No one's interested in listening to the gospel. So me and Rick left this one place. We went down to another bar. When I was down there, we both almost got in a fight with some people. I'm thinking to myself, this isn't good. <laughs> this isn't good. I'm not shining like a light. I'm blending in with the night. And we got to make sure as Christians, we're not blending in. Just because we, got some, we don't want people to think we're weird. Listen, we're only weird because they think we're weird. We're not weird. Rob, you're not weird. They might think you're weird, but you're not weird. You're right. You're right with God. You belong to God. You're a child of God. You got called out of darkness. You're a child of light. Walk as a child of light. Amen. They're the ones that are weird. God created them, gives them life, gives them breath each and every day, and they hate him. Why? They're insane. Sin makes people insane. Insanity begins with sin. Why would anybody want to reject Jesus? He comes, he treats everybody right. Isn't that right? Heals people, does miracles, feeds people, gives them lunch, does everything. They say, away with him, away with him. They spit upon him, they hit him, they crucified him. Does that sound insane? Sin makes people insane. Rejecting God is insanity. And for a Christian not to put God first is a form of insanity. Don't ever let that form of insanity get into your life. Lord, you are first. Lord, you are first. Lord, you are first. Lord, you are first. Lord, you are number one. I am in second place. In fact, the second place is too close to you being first place. I don't care. I'll go ahead and get back here to 10th place. I want you first. I want you always to be first. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Glory to God forevermore. Then he goes. Then he come, we come down here to verse 16. He says, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice of the service of your faith. I am glad and rejoicing with you all. And for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice in me. So what's he saying here? He's telling us, not only are you to shine as lights, which sometimes can be found as a reproof, not just sometimes, all the time, it's found as a reproof and a rebuke, rebuke to the world. When someone's cussing and cursing and you walk up and you're not saying dang or darn, you're saying, oh my. You're not saying heck or hell. You're not using slang. And, and you, everything about you is different. 
when somebody does something to them and they're mad at them, somebody, they see somebody do something to you and you're kind <coughs> back, you show mercy back, you're different. Your, your behavior is rebuking their bad behavior. But not only does godly living do, do, do that, but godly living is the first step of communicating the gospel by the life you live, but also godly living leads to sharing the gospel. Holding fast or holding forth the word of life. What's the word of life refer to in this context? The word of life refers to the whole word of God. But more specifically, it refers to the gospel. Because he's saying it's because of the gospel that these changes are taking place in your life. It's not because of your church these things these changes are taking place in your life. It's not solely because of you that these changes are taking place in your life. God began a good work, and now he is still at work on the inside of you. That's why these changes are coming. And why did he begin a good work? And why is he continuing that good work? Why is he doing that? What is the reason for him doing that? He's doing that because his son came to this planet Earth on a mission to save you from your sins and to rescue you from the damnation that this world is going to end up in. He came to save you. He came to reconcile you. He came to uh, bring you back to God. He came to make you a child of God. He came to make you who you are and what you are, a saint in Christ Jesus. And because of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are what you are. And so when you hold forth the word of life, you're holding forth the gospel. You're holding forth the gospel. Oh, yes, you're holding forth the truth of scriptures to people, no doubt. But the essence of everything you hold forth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me just take you over here to Galatians. We were over there at Galatians a moment ago, weren't we? Let's just go over here to Galatians. Now, I see Reese got a, a brand new motorcycle. He's got himself a Harley. Now, if you ask Reese, Reese, I want you to boast about the greatest motorcycle you, uh, in the world today. He's not going to talk about a Honda. He's not going to talk about a Yamaha. He's not going to talk about some scooter. <laughs> Amen. He's going to talk about a Harley Davidson. In his mind, they, they just, just strip everybody. There's nobody else in the field, right, Reese? It's the way it is. Well, here you got in the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, this is a church that Paul started through preaching the gospel. And it never fails when, when the gospel is preached and someone comes to salvation. What usually happens in, within a week? The doorbell rings and who's standing there? The Jehovah Witness. <laughs> or the Mormon. It never fails. It happens all the time. In other words, when truth has been given to you and you have received that truth and that truth has impacted you and you're a Christian, here comes somebody peddling an alternative. And in the Galatian church, we have the Judaizers peddling an alternative. They're saying, now you're Christians, that's good. But don't you really want to live a great Christian life? Don't you really want to be a full-blown Christian? Well, yes, I do. I, I really, really, really do. Well, this is what you need to do. You need to be circumcised. And you need to come back under the law. Because if you're circumcised and back under the law, now you're in step with Abraham. Now you're in step with all the fathers of the faith. Now you're in step with the Old Testament and the New Testament. You're really full-blown now, Rob. Oh, you're going to become something outstanding. And they were being bewitched by this. They were being fooled by this. They were being drawn aside by this. They were running well, the scripture says. But somebody came by and disturbed their running, following Jesus. By offering them an alternative. So you read over here in chapter 6, verse 14, he says, but God forbid. That's a big word right there. God, but, good phrase. But God forbid. But God won't have it this way. God forbid that, that I, the Apostle Paul, or any Christian, I'll add, should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I'm crucified to the world. Now, he's making a contrast. He's making a distinction between him and the Judaizers, the false teachers. 
The false teachers are saying that circumcision is the law. It's what we do. Not so much what we believe. It's what we do. Have you ever sat underneath a ministry that always taught you do, 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 do? There was a time in my life as a Christian that when I was in the faith stream of things, everybody said, now what you got to do is you need to get the word in your heart, get it down in your mouth. You need to believe this and say this. And then you, you, you will make this happen. You will bring this to pass. You can have what you say. So it was nothing but a, uh, an alternative to take my attention away from the Lord Jesus Christ no longer see him as all sufficient to make me all that I need to be as a Christian. And now look at alternative methods and formulas that I was supposed to put into practice to make me the kind of Christian that I really ought to be. And none of that teaching, not a single iota of that teaching, made any emphasis on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, let alone his cross. Notice he says, I boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, I boast in the Lord Jesus. He doesn't say, I boast in his healing. I boast in his miracles. I boast in his faith. I boast in him walking on the water. I boast in him making bread and fish. I boast in him as the Lord of glory. He doesn't even say that. Think about that. He doesn't even say that. He says, I don't even boast in his person. He says, I boast in his cross. I, burst, I boast in his cross. I, bo I, I boast in what he did. I bo boast in his death on the cross. Because he could be the eternal son of God, but he never went to the cross. There's nothing for me. He could be the eternal son of God, and he could have done miracles and healings, and he could have gave us the great teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. He could have gave us all of these things, and they all would have been right. But if he lifted up his hands and sent it up to heaven, never went to that cross, I'm dead in my sins. I'm under the wrath of God. Even though he is the son of God, even though he is the eternally begotten son of God, even though he is the, the dearest and the precious among men, if he didn't go to that cross, there's no salvation. There's no salvation. You're lost, I'm lost. We're dead in our sins. We have no escape. We have no hope. We will answer to the law's condemnation. We won't be able to escape it. That's why he says, I boast in the, car, in the cross. He says, circumcision can't do that for you. Keeping the law can't do for, that for you. Paul says, and we'll read it here in a little bit in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I'm a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, an Israelite of an Israelite. I'm of the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Pharisee of a Pharisee. I was circumcised not the sixth day, not the seventh day, not the eighth day ninth day but the eighth day baby just like the law says i've kept it i'm blameless according to the law outwardly i'm blameless that was his boast that was why he was rejecting jesus christ that's why he was blaspheming the lord jesus christ that was his boast that's why the pharisees and the religious people rejected the lord jesus christ they were boasting in their works. They were boasting in what they could do. They were boasting in their heritage. They were boasting in that. They didn't see that it was nothing but filthy rags. They didn't see that it was nothing but dung, refuse, garbage, trash. Something that needs to be thrown aside. They didn't know that. So they threw aside the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that he boasts in the Lord Jesus Christ. But why don't people preach the Lord Jesus Christ? His cross. I said it wrong. Why don't people preach the cross? Because it's very offensive. If you had a business today and you started up a brand new business, Paula, would you want to do anything inside that business that would offend people? You don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to have a bunch of people working for you and they all got garbage breath. You don't want nothing. You don't want nobody offending anybody, do you? You want everybody looking good, everybody doing good, real inviting personalities, right? That brings in good business. It's the same way with the church. We don't want anything to offend. Can't help it, folks. Our central message offends everybody. The message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember Rick, when he got saved, he said to me, he's talking to one of his daughters or somebody, and, they, and Rick says, they said to me right away, well, Dad, what about Grandma? See, it brought an offense. You know, the idea was Grandma's saved by the Catholic Church and the sacraments. Well, what about Grandma? 
That's what the Jews were saying to Paul. Well, what about Abraham? What about Moses? What about the Ten Commandments? What about the tabernacle? What about the temple? What about the, the, all the sacrifices? What about, what about, what about, what about? Who are you? Who do you think you are? We don't like you. Let's grab him. Let's, let, let's persecute him. Let's send him to prison. Let's, let's get rid of him. Look what the scriptures say right here. In verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised. Only that they may not what? Only that they may not what? Suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ brings persecution. Why does it bring persecution? Because it brings offense. Look at verse 11 of chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 11. Chapter 5 of verse 11, the book of Galatians, this will be our last verse. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? In other words, if I'm preaching an alternative, why should I suffer persecution? You and I are not called to preach alternatives. You and I are not just... Hear me right when I say this. We're not just to preach Jesus Christ. We're to preach the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where the offensive. He goes on. Why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of Jesus Christ has ceased. Doesn't say that, does it? He says the offense of the cross has ceased. It's the cross that offends. It's the cross that offends. It's the cross that offends. You know, we got next week. Is good. Uh, is is. Uh, the Sunday before Easter, I think, isn't it, Rick? I think it is. Is that Palm Sunday? I'm asking. I only ask Rick for vocabulary things. Don't ask me about Catholic religious days. Dana, Easter's in two weeks, right? You're right. Okay, so next week and the following week, I'm just going to proclaim the cross to you. To the point that you say, Woo, Apostle Paul, get over there. I'm glowing in the cross. You're not going to... That's going to be the acid test. Are you glorying in the cross? Are you boasting in the cross? Well, Reese, he stands up and says, all you little Yamaha scooters, get out of the way. This is Harley time. Right? He boasts of the Harley. But when it comes to his salvation, he says, all you religious dudes, off to the side. It's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your religion can't help me. Your religion can't save me. Your religion can't revive me. Your religion can't renew me. Your religion can't make me into the person God wants me to be. Your religion leaves me dead in my sins. It leaves me alone, separate from God. It leaves me under the wrath of God, under the condemnation of the law. It leaves me in a place I don't want to be. I need the cross. I need the cross. I need the sacrifice of Jesus. I need his death. I need the death of the beloved, only begotten Son of God. I need him to shed his blood. My sins can't get washed away by church. My sins can't be washed away with circumcision. My sins can only be washed away with the blood of Jesus Christ. And if those sins aren't washed away, I am subject to the condemnation of God's law. There is no hope for me, doesn't matter how nice I am, how good I am, how friendly I am, how anything I might be, it makes no difference. My sins are killing me if I don't have an answer for them. I've tried religion. Rick, you tried it. We've all tried it. Did it wash your sins away? Did it give you a new heart? Did it take out a stony heart? Did it put a brand new heart in it? Did it put the Holy Spirit in you? Did it? It never did. Did it give you a hope? Did it drive out the fear of death? Fear of the grave? Fear of the judgment? Never did any of that. But the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ drives it all out. Amen. Glory to God forevermore. So when we hold fast the word of life, when we hold forth the word of life, we're holding it forth. We have a foundation to hold it forth. With. We are a testimony of that gospel, what it has done to us. And then we hold forth that gospel and we say, this gospel of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, what it's done for me, it can do for you. Believe what, it has, what he has done on that cross. Can you say amen? amen? Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. The word of God, your word, your message. Your, Lord God, your holy scriptures have helped us, have lifted us, have blessed us, have renewed us and revived us. Oh, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, may we hold dear 
to our hearts what we heard here this morning. And may we be found by your spirit and by your grace, devout followers of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, living for him each and every moment of each and every day, living lives that match the gospel, not contradicting the gospel, but matching the gospel. May we shine as the stars against the black night before those that are of a perverse and crooked generation. May they, Father, see the difference that you have made in our life. And may it open up an opportunity where they ask us, why are you the way you are? What is the hope that you have in your heart? And Lord, that we can sanctify you in our hearts and we can turn to them and give them the answer. It is the cross of my Savior, God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has applied to my heart that makes me the way I am. Lord, help us, we pray. Keep us as we leave this place and come again. In Jesus' name, amen.